thanks, Brendan. So with that, we're going to move into a bit of a panel discussion, question and answer um, for folks um, on this topic. And for folks that joined us since we've already started this morning and are wondering why this session is called Coral Restoration, but we're all talking about sponges here, um, is that we're really trying to broaden our horizons when we think about restoration. We're really trying to start thinking about restoration in terms of all of the components of it, not just putting more corals back on the reef. And so that's what the whole purpose of today is about. So with that, we're gonna start taking questions in the room. And if folks have questions that are on the webinar, go ahead and type those into the questions box and we'll go ahead and get those there. So, um, Allison, are you doing microphone or? Yeah. When you... So questions in the room for the panel. And you guys should have a mic. So uh, this question is related to sponge density in terms of restoration. Have you guys worked out at this point right now in the area of, of impact in Florida Bay kind of what the optimal sponge density would be for outplanting in terms of doing full scale restoration? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you able to hear me, hear me from there? Yeah. Yeah. So the um, we haven't done. I mean, optimal. One has to define up, yeah. right? I mean, so that that's really kind of the issue. What we've done is um, when we've done our restoration, we see high and low biomass. Our high biomass sites are the median of of the normal of natural sites, and our low biomass are 10% of those. So the answer is you know I don't know what an optimal was, but our experiments we just tried to get up to what is the kind of natural range. Now, yeah, what Marlo didn't get a chance to talk about though is one of the things that really plays into this. Though, is that um, in these shallow water environments, and as Brenda was saying, even on the reefs, but certainly in the shallow water environments, there's pretty good evidence now that these things are probably competing for food. Who would have thought these sponges are just, they're filtering so much water. And so, Marlow done a series of transplant experiments, for example, that show if we have a high density, and even in high density and medium density areas, we get vastly different growth rates of sponges as we moved around. So, if again, in terms of how to kind of want to define optimal, right? If we put too many out in too dense an area, we're going to reduce growth rates and probably reduce fecundity. So we, one might want to actually you know, maybe put out more sites, right, and perhaps lower density so you don't retard growth. So it's a, there's, you know, there's, there's a complicated question. Can I just chime in real quick yeah, with that? Yeah. So if you're looking interested in density, there's some uh, good work by Stephen and Sweet, sweat, uh, from, uh, I want to say it was done back in early, early 2000s, maybe earlier than that, but they've done uh, a large scale surveys of sponges in Florida Bay. And so we know what some of these uh, densities were before these die offs happened. Uh, so they've got at least two papers on this that looks at some of the community there. Uh, there's another really interesting paper that relates to uh, some of this work by Peterson et al. I forget what year it is, but uh, they're oops, that was five, seven, seven, something like that. Yeah, that I've worked. So they're um, and what they've been able to do is calculate uh, the, the density that would have been uh, around and able to control these biotonic blooms that really were sort of um, we figure are, are driving these patterns of the right, But so both of those are recommended. So, so Spark mentioned that the measuring growth in, in natural areas are very dense and then transplanting to to areas where there are no sponges, so areas that have been wiped out by blooms. What we're seeing is almost a thousand fold difference. And growth rate. So sponges where guys are doing cuttings and, and uh, creating these nursery habitats, you're seeing maybe a centimeter or two of growth each year versus sponges that I've moved into areas that have been killed off by blooms, we're seeing doubling or tripling in sizes over the course of the year. Um, so so maybe we should start spreading our sponges in our nursery out a little bit more so they're not on top of each other filtering and trying to acquire food. Have you controlled that too by actually taking portions of the cuttings and keeping them on site where you actually harvest the sponge just to see if, if, that, um, if that growth rate is, is equitable? Um, for, so, that? for that particular experiment, what I did was an individual sponge cut up into multiple pieces, and then that piece was moved, stayed in that area, the medium sponge biomass, and then into areas where there's no sponges. So, it's the same individual. Practically in, in all these different environments. Yeah. 
So I'm going to ask um, if you can please wait for the microphone because people on the webinar, even though you can hear in the room, aren't going to be able to hear both the questions and the answers unless you use the microphone. Hi there, great panel session. Uh, Rob Burbaugh with the Nature of Insurgency. Uh, so a, a variation for me to next to Kent's challenging question is, so what's, how big is the uh, recruitment uh, or reproductive sort of signal around the trans uh, sites that I that depends to some degree that we know that? Or? Don't know, Rob. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, and maybe something we should try to look at around our recruitment sites our recruitment sites, or I should say restoration sites, are 25 by 25 uh, meters. So that's about the size of each one of these, and we put out 30 or something of these out uh, in different areas. Um, and we just looked within that 25 square meter area, and I actually haven't looked out you know, beyond that in terms of the sponge recruits. Looking at sponge recruits is kind of looking for coral recruits, you know, it's not an easy sort of thing. One, one thing I think it might actually spur a question or two, but just to mention as well, though, one of the things we're facing is the same thing we're facing in terms of coral reef restoration. That is, we're still restoring things against the backdrop of continued degradation. And uh, when you think of this, is that we've actually lost a number of our restoration sites. Um, we put quite a few sites out in the Everglades National Park boundary within Florida Bay, and all those were wiped out um, in 2013 by another bloom. <clears throat> so these cyanobacteria blooms, the sponges are quite capable of removing bacterial size and cyanobacteria at lower concentrations. These blooms, exceed, these blooms exceed the densities that we take really effectively filter for you. We don't really understand the mechanisms for the, how they die or anything like that yet. But that's something we all, you know, against climate change, should you be restoring coral reefs? Right? That's a question we all have to kind of deal with. You know, it, should you be putting frags out there if, if temperatures are continuing to rise? And we get the same questions with, with, with sponges. If we continue to have these blooms and they become more frequent, you know, in the 30 something years I've been working out here, you know, these things weren't around when we I first started working. And now they're becoming more and more frequent, these cyanobacteria blooms. But I, I guess you have to try. Right? Can I jump in on that real quick? But since I'm moderating, I get to say a few things. So I think that's a really important point, though. It's an important point that I want to just further elaborate on kind of this question of restoration, whether it's for sponges or corals, and kind of this backdrop of this changing environment. And I think it's really important that as we talk about this type of restoration that we're all messaging on this topic correctly. The reality is if the environment continues to change the way the environment's changing, regardless, we're not gonna even, these, nothing's going to exist in these environments. We have to deal with all of these things. But if we think that just fixing climate is the solution, we're not going to have any of these sponges or any of these corals still on these reefs in 50 or 100 years when that change happens, when things start to finally cool back down again. Um, and so if we are going to be optimistic, and I tend to be a glass half full kind of person on these topics, that maybe someday we will get our act together on the climate issues, we have to be doing these restoration issues in the background to make sure we still have the biomass and the reproductive capacity in the system to be able to then allow that recovery to take place. If I can add just one more thing to that, I think along that line, if we can, when we're doing restoration, try to do, at least our perspective is, if we can try to learn from each of those restorations. I mean, yes, we want to restore and build up those populations, but if we can do it in an experimental way where we're asking some question that can help us in the future to understand these ecosystems and how they respond and how they, so I think always keep in mind as you're doing restoration, these are something new we can learn from and then design that restoration project with that in mind. So we're always gaining more knowledge each of the steps. Yes, um, I noticed that where the sponges died is the hard ground areas that are just to the west of the uh, Florida Keys, uh, which is downwind. And of course, you know, they're they saturate the area from the air with mosquito spray. Uh, it's been going on since the early 70s. Uh, I wonder if anyone has considered doing any bioassays just to see what these nailing these various pesticides do to live corals. 
Yeah, getting to the question, the answer is you know, that nothing to my knowledge has been done with pesticides to so nail it on sponges. You know, we've done some work with spiny lobsters and other crustaceans, but sponges, um, no, we've not. We've the same thing. Okay, we have some questions from online, so we'll um, start trying to answer some of those. Okay, so Brenda, these first two are for you. Um, the first one was, did the species of sponge that you used uh, influence the number and diversity of coral reef? That's a good question. Now, I don't know that I even attempted to tease that out. Uh, that's, that's a really good point. Maybe I have to go back in the data and look at that. Uh, what I did find was that, uh, so I also looked at uh, whether or not using sponges in two ways was sustainable. And for that, what I did was measure grains of tissue replacement. So the rate at which uh, the um, 10 centimeters of uh, sponge material volume was replaced, and also sponge growth rate to determine how um, the frequency at which you could uh, excise tissue for use in this. And I found that there are differences in the species in which they uh, reproduce tissue and grow. So that's one aspect of it. And then I found that there are also differences of a uh, sponge species performance in the piles. And the phase of recta often uh, disappeared completely on the outside of the piles, but did really well at stabilizing on the inside. Obviously, the polyphorus performed the best, uh, it survived you know, well, um, and did a great job inside and outside. And then the opposite species, the thickest, largest ones, look robust and I thought would be great, uh, often suffered completely without. Uh, so there are species specific differences, and part of the publication that I have on this topic uh, deals with selecting species and how we might most properly go about doing that. Okay, and then the second question is: um, It says we have a reef restoration program where we transmit coral trans fragments onto metal structures. We put rubble beneath the structure for fish recruitment. Would you recommend we add sponge to the rubble? Can we also transmit sponges on the metal structure itself? In the gaps between the fragments in order to reduce macroalgae growth, or would that compete with the fragments themselves? So, uh, sponges are highly sensitive organisms. I know when uh, my advisor would put uh, ABC into uh, uh, mangroves to attach sponge fragments to them, look at growth rates and stuff. You have to buy the uh, pricey PVC, right? The hot cold stuff, because you have to complete sponge mortality if you don't. Uh, I never put sunscreen on when I would go in the field, because uh, if you touch a sponge after you've done that, you can kill that. Take sponge out of the water and expose it to air. As one of Mark's students uh, learned, uh, you know, back then, you will have mortality. So, uh, attaching sponges to metal, um, there are some reports of sponges growing on uh, sunken ships, and so, you know, it's possible. Uh, certainly, uh, attaching sponges to rubble, but it's also a good idea to know which sponges you're using. Uh, again, for this study, I'm using a wreck branching sponges. If you fly fisheries are dominated by sexual propagation, they recover well, they regenerate well. Uh, a lot of the species that uh, these guys are using in the bay, these are dicker, it's rotted, they're highly spongent. Um, they're really resistant to damage, but they're generally poor recoveries following the injury. Uh, when I looked at all the sponges, some of these characteristics that I dealt with in my mm -hmm. dissertation. So, if you're using stuff like that, they're pretty much going to have necrosis start immediately. They'll, you know, just dwindle away and then eventually be gone. And, and so, I would recommend if you're going to do something using the red-branching species, uh, probably good way. And then the last question is about sponge nurseries. Um, are you expanding the nurseries by fragmenting the sponges in the nursery or from donor colonies? And are the growth rates in the nurseries similar to donor colonies, or are they growing to have first order in the nursery? Uh, so, so it depends on the species. Uh, the Arsenias, those uh, base and brown branching species, uh, those seem to be the fastest growers, uh, followed by uh, a couple of commercial species. We don't have a lot of those in our nurseries, but they're in kind of those weedy species that grow the quickest. Uh, now we're a year and a half into the project. We have 6,500 or so uh, fragments. A lot of those have gotten very big, and we're now at the point where we're starting to be able to fragment from the uh, uh, We're in the summer right now. We don't really do it during the, the warmer temperatures. So uh, this coming fall, that's when we really plan to start uh, propagating from the mid. Hi, thank you. Um, the presentation today were excellent. Um, I'm Tracy Ziggler from the National Health Service. And my question is, one of the original um, back uh, 
long time ago and I did every day. One of the original questions of sponge restoration was could you use uh, sponges to mitigate algal blooms or could you find specific species that were valuable to put inside an algal bloom and help to uh, deter those effects? Is that still a research question applicable or did, have you guys found that that's just something that the algal blooms are just too um, at a high magnitude where it just, that just can't be conquered or is that still something in progress? Yeah, hi Tracy. I think we worked with you guys very early on when we started doing some of this work. And um, not us, but others have started to look at much more detail about the dynamics of these cyanobacteria blooms. And you know, it's a complicated, like so many things, it's quite complicated. There are changes in the clades of cyanobacteria that when they become bloom like, the actual, there is an actual genetic change. Uh, one species becomes more dominant. And the problem is that. They also become chain forming quite useful adjuvants, and so that's the issue. So, um, we certainly do know which species of sponges are most resilient, and so we, we certainly know that. And if one could produce enough of those in the area, um, again, I think theoretically, yes, you could mitigate it. Um, but the problem is, you know, these blooms are big, and you know, we're talking about, you know, a restoration site that would have to be enormous to be able to mitigate it to the point where it wouldn't then jumpstart that second clade that becomes really kind of the death knell for these. So it's one of those things that's theoretically possible, but you know, this is a, you'd have to put a heck of a lot of effort in doing stuff like that. But I think with FWC, in this whole idea about kind of scaling up, I think the, the, the more they can do with that and community involvement, I, I think we're going to see you know, better results in terms of um, these restorations. Uh, but against this backdrop of continuing climate related issues, it's, it's hard to say what the long term target uses is. So while the microphone is moving, I will also say that sponges have been used in uh, fire remediation uh, for, uh, for uh, <coughs> pathogens and, and viruses in ports and other than some papers from uh, the, in Japan where that's gone on. But I mean, as Mark said, these basins are massive. Uh, sponges clearly work in bones and blooms for a while, but this overwhelms cascading series of events uh, and getting that density and biomass back is just going to be tough. Yeah, another quick question for you all. Um, I, won't, I won't bring up optimal again, I promise, but um, it kind of gets towards that a little bit. Um, we do, we practice restoration here at FWC and restoring these massive communities and, and the broad areas are certainly of interest to us. In the and I think that there's a good possibility we, we could potentially have, you know, funding to assist in that process. But, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we've talked about this, Mark, so. <laughs> and I'll introduce you to one of my staff too, <laughs> shortly here. Um, but, um, I mean, we're talking about full-scale implementation over the long term. And I really agree with the, the overall concept of, you know, providing these uh, these nurseries is kind of an argument you know, to, to, to a degree or having something established so that when the blooms occur, we can respond to them um, and after everything dissipates. But have you guys worked out um, the cost efficacy on some of this? I mean, it, it seems to me as though um, having the having the, the, the nursery areas on a continuous basis is a, is a huge expense. And any marine habitat restoration work is extraordinarily costly. But in general, have you worked out kind of a, a per acre basis for restoration, full scale restoration, when we're talking about diverse communities and all? Uh, being that we're not uh, conducting the large scale restoration yet, we haven't gotten it down to a per acre metric, but throughout the process, we've been keeping track of uh, man hours, uh, you know, uh, propagation hours, material expenses, and we've been talking around with some materials to see if we can refine it, but so far, it seems like this this method that we've been using for the past few years uh, seems to be the most cost effective for the time being. Uh, we hope that by the end of this project, or once we're to the point where we can uh, conduct this restoration, we will be able to estimate the cost, perhaps in a metric per acre or per hectare, something like that. Great talk, great panel, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Joe Lopez from uh, Southeastern University, and uh, uh, the uh, idea of restoration with using sponges is uh, it's, uh, great to see it uh, progress. 
we've uh, done some work looking at the microbiomes of sponges. We know they're filter feeders, they're taking a lot of hot water, and we published a, a paper looking at the healthy microbiomes of uh, various species of sponges last year. So I was curious as to if you see any disease in your nurseries, and if not, what else is taking them out of the survivorship? So uh, the one real notable uh, source of mortality we had in one of our nurseries, ironically, the westernmost nursery uh, out past Moser Channel, uh, we did have uh, a much less severe bloom that uh, originated in the Central Bay, Rankin uh, Lake area, Mystery Basin area. Uh, appears it was wind driven uh, in the uh, fall of 2016. Went through the nursery um, in, and in the broader area, lost a lot of the uh, brown branching uh, base sponges, uh, the uh, spongia species. Uh, the more resilient loggerheads were kept intact, uh, both in the nursery and throughout the surrounding hard bottom habitats, uh, which uh, I would say was to be expected given the species specific uh, sensitivity of blooms in the past. Um, but uh, uh, nothing in terms of disease yet. Um, well, I, that's true, but we've had a couple of sites where when it gets particularly hot, you get this very thick white film that sort of grows over top of the sponges, and, and every sponge in that particular area will, will eventually die off, and a lot of the, some of the roving sponges will start to turn black once that, that biofilm starts to build up on top of it, but it doesn't seem to be species specific. We'll get it on like the, um, the Arsenia species and it'll also be on the Spongia species as well. As well. That tends to happen when it's particularly hot when we get that, that big boom in whatever, whether it's a fungus or a seed that covers all of the species of sponge. So both of those are kind of covered, right? Um, yeah. yeah, so um, do you uh, clusters are, are so this is directed to when clusters are published a paper in the 1980s, something like this, where uh, looking at sponges in mangrove lagoons. And we found that essentially um, heat stress led to uh, symbiont control breakdowns of the sponges, and that their sign of bacterial symbiont actually just devoured the sponges. And so if somebody else just broke down, once you turn to pathogenicity, and that could possibly be what you're observing. Thanks, uh, Phil Brenner, Florida Institute of Oceanography. Uh, thanks for uh, introducing me to the whole world of sponge restoration. My question really has to do with, if any of you looked at um, the net benefit of the restoration versus some of the negative effects that sponges can have, I'm specifically thinking of flattening of reef substrates or erosion, fire erosion. And have you quantified any of the rates of fire erosion between, say, Holocene coral level versus you know, Pleistocene hard bottom? And, uh, what is your overall recommendation with respect to those negative effects of sponge? Yeah, um, I don't, that's a good question. I would argue that um, those are not necessarily negative effects, right? Coral uh, coral reefs are not just the sum of accretion. Uh, it's a dynamic process. So it includes you know, the breakdown, the reef damage, the reincorporation of material, uh, and then you know, recruitment to that material and growth and accretion, et cetera, on and on in a dynamic cycle. Um, and I think that you know, some of the early work in the 70s and 80s, the geologists going around the Caribbean and looking at reefs, uh, start taking cores, they realize these are you know, trash sheets of detritus that have been found by diagenetics imitation or work process coral analogy and things recruiting to them, et cetera. So the reworking of carbonate is actually a, a functional role of importance on coral reefs. And I completely agree that we're in a situation where things have changed slightly, right? I think if you broaden our perspective, we look back and we say, look, this is supposed to be happening. But if you think about things now, where the eutrophication increased nutrients, uh, that a lot of these sponges that are participating in these uh, activities um, have zooxanthellae as photoendor symbionts, right? And so uh, you get fuel from these nutrients, uh, it drives this, you get increased growth of these organisms, you get increased uh, fermentation and colonization. These are the, the few sponges that have been documented in the Caribbean, uh, generally within the Cleomids, but you also have Acapulco and um, that will uh, overgrow and kill coral, right? Most sponges, uh, there's some good work done by Eric's 
uh, back in the 1990s that looked at sponge uh, coral interactions and pretty much after not just taking time uh, uh, snapshots but looking at them in time series found that they're pretty much standoff interactions. Now, if you do have these, these corals, they're eutrophication and that um, tends to lead to uh, problems and, and overgrowth. So, um, you know, I would say that uh, we're trying to use species here uh, that I'm, especially that I'm using that uh, aren't bio rotors. I, as a pilot study, this entire thing, I went down to the Torrey Keys and I found this red cranking sponge in, in the back country of the bay. Uh, and I, you know, strapped it to coral level and I went home to tell my uh, advisor, you know, check this out, it's great, I'll show her a photo. She's like, that's clean at the very end, right? That, that's a bio rotor, but that's not going to help you, you know, reestablish such kind of stability and things like that. So it's a brand new guys. And so, um, we're not trying to use those species. Uh, yeah. I think we have a few questions online still. Please. Okay, so this one is another nursery question. What's the turnover time in nursery for you to reviving or outfitting? And what is, do you have a, a sense of the range of growth rates for different? Yeah, uh, so the growth rates certainly do vary among the species. Um, the ones we've seen that are, I guess, the equivalent of the, the old growth uh, forest, those big loggerheads, uh, though they seem to persist through uh, some of these algal blooms or the cyanobacteria blooms, at least the less severe ones, better than the other species, they also seem to be the slowest growing. Uh, some of the weedier species, often ones you'll find not even attached to the bottom, almost like a tumbleweed, what we call rollers, um, they seem to nearly double in size over a year or so. Um, again, it depends on, uh, it seems to depend on the density, uh, you know, uh, and it's certainly the density of sponges in the nursery. And as we increase, you know, we're expecting to increase our nursery system to hold 15,000 sponges. We may have to change uh, our techniques, perhaps a series of smaller uh, nurseries throughout the area. One, to not put all our eggs in one basket if one gets hit by, say, uh, a bloom or so, uh, but also to uh, maximize growth rates. Okay, and then the second one, Brendan, I think you might have had this in your presentation, but which species of coral or fruit were most abundant on the sponge feed at all? So the uh, Bavia was, no, Agrisia, I'm sorry, it was the genera that was most common across all treatments. Uh, so just a lot of Agrisia and Agrisites in, uh, in Curacao. But what else about the grasses, uh, Coltelia nepens, um, Bavia fragum, uh, I forget all the uh, species and genera that I found, but, but certainly Agrisia was most common. So if we if we could take one quick question in the room, I think, and then we're going to have to go to our break. Excellent talk. I just am curious. Similar to corals, we often protect those most beautiful places, but are finding now that those places that are most degraded may be the best future for us because they're already tolerating pretty extreme conditions. I'm curious within species whether you're seeing variability and survivability from the cyanobacteria, that selectivity may make a difference in setting up your nurseries? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and um, we try to get some funding to do that. You know, do that, of course, we're talking about all the genomic work, which tends to be a little more expensive. Uh, and it's hard to know. We certainly in these bloom areas, um, on the periphery of these areas, sometimes there are a few uh, lucky individuals. Well, we don't, we don't know if they're lucky individuals, sponges, or whether they're the ones that are adapted to those kinds of changes. And so you're, you're exactly right. We, we've been sort of hoping to be able to do that kind of work to pick out a few of those and actually see if they're genetically different and actually then look at the you know, physiological functions. When we're talking about heat stress protein or something like that that, that might work and that might, that might correlate with those genes. There, there's, you know, the genomics of the body sponges is is, um, is still pretty much in its infancy, to be honest, Not, especially the ones that occur in the back. We know more about coral reef sponges than we do in the sponges that occur in the back bay areas, which is kind of squizzy, I guess, since there's not much work um, been done with those. And it's also, of course, complicated, much like corals, 
with all the endosymbionts. So it just complicates everything in terms of genomics. Um, so the long answer is really, um, you know, it's a great question and it's something we really need to look at, but I don't think there's too much work on that. Great. Well, thank you guys very much for the wonderful talks this morning. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll be back at 10.15. Right? 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 Right?